Hey guys, welcome back. I hope you are having an amazing day. Let's get right into the stories. The first one is an entitled people story. When my wife and I bought our house last year, we were thrilled to have a backyard with a pool. We looked forward to lazy summer days lounging by the water with our five-year-old daughter, Emma. The previous owners told us the homeowners associations took care of shared amenities like the pool and clubhouse. I didn't think much of it at the time. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> the first sign of trouble came early this summer when I received a notice from the homeowners association stating new pool rules. The letter said that only homeowners associations members over 18 were allowed to use the pool and guests had to be accompanied by a resident at all times. I scratched my head wondering if this was a mistake. Our real estate agent had assured us the pool was part of the package when we bought the place. I decided to go straight to the source and attended the next homeowners associations meeting to clear up the confusion. As soon as I mentioned my daughter using the pool, the president, an older bald man named Phil, sneered at me. This is an adult community pool, he declared. We can't have unsupervised children running around being disruptive. I tried to explain that Emma was well behaved and that we would be watching her the whole time, but Phil refused to budge. The rules have been set. No exceptions, he said sternly. The other board members nodded in agreement, their expressions stern. I realized I was fighting a losing battle and would get nowhere with these people. Defeated, I left and reluctantly broke the news to my wife and Emma when I got home. My daughter's crestfallen face just about broke my heart. The pool was one of the main selling points of the house for our family. Denying Emma access to it seemed incredibly unfair and ridiculous. As the hot summer days dragged on, I watched enviously as the neighborhood kids splashed around and played Marco Polo in our pool. It made my blood boil to see Emma gazing longingly out the window at the water she was banned from enjoying. One unbearable 90-degree day, I'd had enough. I decided to take matters into my own hands. With floaties on her arms and sunscreen slathered across her face, I led Emma out to the pool. No power-hungry homeowners associations was going to ruin our summer. We had been relaxing in the water for twenty blissful minutes when I heard the gate aggressively swing open. Phil came storming toward us, face purple with rage. What do you think you're doing? He bellowed. You are violating the rules. I calmly told him that we were simply using our backyard pool as any homeowner should be able to do. Phil was fuming. You signed a contract agreeing to follow our policies when you moved into this neighborhood. He spat. No, we didn't actually, I replied. This caught Phil off guard. I explained that after the last homeowners associations meeting, I dug up our paperwork and discovered we had never agreed to any covenants or signed control of the pool over to the homeowners associations. In fact, the pool was located squarely on our private property. Phil stood there opening and closing his mouth like a fish out of water. He clearly did not expect me to have a solid grasp of the legal documentation. After a few awkward moments of stunned silence, he finally sputtered out a weak threat to take us to court if we continued to violate the pool policies. I calmly told Phil we were fully within our rights to use our own pool, whenever we damn well pleased. If he wanted to take us to court, he was welcome to waste his money. Fuming, Phil stormed off empty-handed while Emma and I enjoyed the rest of our pool day. In the following weeks, I exchanged some tersely worded letters back and forth with the homeowners association's lawyer but their position was growing weaker by the day. Once I showed them the property line and permitting paperwork for the pool, it became abundantly clear we had the upper hand. After a month of blustering threats from the homeowners' associations leading nowhere, they finally backed down. Their lawyer sent me a letter acknowledging that, upon further review of the property boundaries and permitting paperwork, it appears your pool lies on your private land, not homeowners' associations' common area. It went on to say they would no longer obstruct my family's access to it. I excitedly shared the news with Emma, whose eyes lit up brighter than the sun glinting off the water. That weekend, we invited all her friends over for an epic pool party to celebrate. Watching a dozen happy kids splashing around guilt-free in our pool was the sweetest revenge I could imagine against Phil and his cronies. Ever since our legal victory, standing up to the ridiculous homeowners' associations has felt amazing. Just yesterday I caught Phil glaring angrily as I helped Emma practice swimming across the pool. I gave him a big smile and wave as they paddled by. With summer winding down, I'm grateful I didn't let power-hungry busybodies ruin our family's pool time. The whole ordeal made me realize it's not worth compromising when you know you're in the right. I learned to stand firm because no amount of intimidation tactics can supersede the law and documentation on your side. Our house may come with an obnoxious homeowners associations attached but it doesn't mean I have to take their BS lying down. 
After all, I'm the rightful owner. And that pool belongs to me. The next one is a pro-revenge story. Cast. Stop. Me. Female. 5 and 11. Bob. Friend. Store manager. Chief. My boss. Entitled jerk. Who lost his car. Okay, background. I worked as a firefighter as an investigator for an independent department. For information, a investigator was the rank of LT. And was based out of a large station, two engines, one newer 110 tower ladder truck, relative later, one chief car, and one utility truck. Every day the food duties changed from firefighter to firefighter. My chief's turn to cook when this happened. My friend Bob worked as a GM of a small grocery store. There was a long empty space in front of the store marked with the following sign, Emergency Vehicles Only. Enter entitled Jerk. He had a nice-looking BMW car and always parked in the above spot every week. Bob told Entitled Jerk that he couldn't park there. I can park wherever I make more in a day that you make in a week. My friend calls me complaining about Entitled Jerk. I agree to go and watch the spot. I get into our utility truck which had the department decals on the door and a single red light on the dash. I park in the emergency vehicle's only spot. As I am walking in, I hear, You can't park there, it's my special spot. I turn and look at Entitled Jerk. Excuse me, I ask. I am on official duties and can park there. I pointed to the decal on the door. Entitled jerk looks and says, You can't be a firefighter, you're a girl. Move your truck and leave C-word. Now I'm proud of my job. In a department of 2,000, I was one of five women on the department. I graduated top in my class. I have a shocked-looking expression on my face. I get really pissed off. I walk into my friend's office to get more information about his problem with entitled jerk as Bob explains the continuous parking violations and I see a small notice on the fire suppression system, sprinklers, that said the inspection was coming up, I smile as I get an idea. Cue the revenge. I get some information, leave Bob's office and get into the truck heading back to the station I arrive and head into my chief's office. I tell him of entitled jerk and what he said and does. Chief is a 6, 6 inches, 320 samo and he sees everyone as family. Chief's face gets bright red. I explained my idea, and he gets very happy. He rushes out and calls a station meeting. I lay out my idea. We send out the station to do a fire drill inspection by sending the old truck and one engine to the store. My friend will call the station the next time entitled Jerk Parks in the fire lane. Skip to two weeks later, Bob called the station stating that entitled Jerk had just parked. As I am thanking him, I hear his fire alarm go off. I rush and change into my investigator uniform with turnout gear, tell chief, and send the trucks out. I ride in the quint. We arrive and I see entitled Jerk's car right in the emergency vehicle spot. I radio to have one engine to pull right in front of entitled Jerk's car and the truck to park right beside the driver's side door. I get out and the engineer starts setting up the ladder which means four very large and heavy support struts go down and one crushes the front of his hood. The alarm goes off. The lineman breaks his windows as he runs the large five-inch draft line from the pump to the standpipes the fire access to the sprinkler system. Through his front seats, I go in to find Bob hurriedly getting people out as the alarm is going off. Entitled Jerk runs out of the store, sees his car, and goes ballistic. I radio the PD dispatch and request a few officers to the store as I had a male was impeding a fire operation. The dispatcher says that they will send a few officers. Three officers show up and I ask them to follow me. They do when I call out. Hey, leave my firefighters alone. Entitled Jerk turns and sees me, he rushes up screaming that I'll pay for damaging his precious baby, his car. I stop him and tell him that if he didn't leave that, he would be arrested. He gets in my face. You did this, he'll have your job for this? He then turns pushing me back. The officers and I rush and tackle Entitled Jerk to the ground. After they cuff him, I calmly inform EB that he was under arrest for assault and interference with a fire investigation and that his car would be towed for parking in a fire lane. I later found out that it was crushed. Entitled Jerk got 12 months probation for pushing me and interfering with a fire operation. He also got a fine of $500 for parking the cost of the tow, and he lost his nice BMW. And Moral of this story, don't park where you shouldn't or bad things will happen. The next one is a petty revenge story. I work from home full time and rarely drive unless I'm grocery shopping or out for an appointment. In my complex, there are non-reserved spots and reserved spots in the underground garage all of which are not assigned. As long as you have a reserved sticker on your vehicle, any of the reserved spots, which are all labeled reserved, are fair game. I have a non-reserved sticker because it's $40 cheaper than the reserved pass. 
I was coming back from an appointment and turned into my neighbor's reserved spot so that I could back my car into the open, non-reserved spot behind me. Lo and behold, male Karen in his rusty 2007 RAV4 starts honking at me for being in his spot, telling me that I can't park there because I don't have a reserved sticker. I told him I was only backing out, and I probably should have let it go, but his Karenness pissed me off so much. As I was getting on the elevator, I quickly realized he only wanted to park there was because it was right next to the elevator. A light bulb went off in my head and I made my way to the rental office, it's insane building, and asked to upgrade my parking pass. It's an extra $40. I'll be shelling out, but it's worth the petty revenge. I'm waiting for him to leave for work tomorrow so I can move my car into his spot and leave it there for God knows how long. There are perks to being fully remote. The next one is a malicious compliance story. The nursing home I work in has gone through multiple members of management. Every time we get a new director of nursing, D-O-N, we have a mandatory meeting where he, she will introduce themselves and the new rules they put into place. One of the ghosts of Don's past was one I'll call Karen. She had the haircut, the attitude, and the shrill voice. The first rule Karen set into place was that one CNA had to be on the hall at all times. Absolutely no exceptions. We were seriously understaffed, so it wasn't always possible to always be on the hall. Being one of the CNAs who has to work the hall alone a lot because there are no people who will come in to help, I of course tried to explain what the flaw was in her rule. She did that, I'm the dominant one head tilt, and interrupted me to say, you don't need to question my rules. The next rule Karen set was that there would be absolutely no cell phone usage in the facility. All cell phones had to be left in our vehicles or in a basket next to the time clock. No exceptions. This ticked off even the members of the administration. The scheduler will text people to ask if they will come into work. The nurses use cell phones to communicate with the director and Don when they aren't in the facility. People grumbled, but she yelled, These are the rules. If you don't like it, you can find another job. CNAs are a dime a dozen. That is exactly what some of the CNAs did. We lost four more people right after that meeting, making us even more understaffed. This ticked me off because one of them was the best partner I ever had. So here comes my petty revenge malicious compliance. And the first day I had to work alone after that meeting, I kept her words in mind. One CNA on the hall at all times. No exceptions. One of our VIP residents hit the call light within 10 minutes of my shift, wanting some brownies from the kitchen. The kitchen is off the hall, so I go straight to Karen's office, which luckily was on my hall. Karen, I'm the only aide here, and Miss Carr wants some brownies from the kitchen. Karen, why are you telling me? Go get them for her. Me. You said there has to be one CNA on the hall at all times. I can't leave the hall to get them. Karen, then get another CNA to go get them for you. Me. You said we can't use cell phones, so I have no way to contact another aide. She gets up from her desk in a huff and gets the brownies. When she returns, she shoves the brownies in my hands and says, Don't bother me for petty mess again. Okay, even more compliance. Because she was stubborn, this malicious compliance went on for a few hours, so I'll shorten it into a list. No residents were harmed during the malicious compliance. Keep in mind that this all happened within one shift. I work on a very demanding hall with nearly 40 people on it. Before you say that, there shouldn't be one CNA to 40 people. Trust me, I know. Three residents wanted wash clothes or towels, but I didn't have any so I couldn't go get them one. Five more residents wanted snacks from the kitchen, but I was the only CNA and couldn't get them any. Two residents wanted showers, which I could have done, but I wasn't allowed to leave the hall to find an aide to watch mine while I did it. The trash stunk like holy hell, but I couldn't leave the hall to take it out, so it stunk up the hallway in Karen's office. I may have moved the trash bin closer to her door. I couldn't pass out ice water because I couldn't leave the hall to get the ice cart. Supper trays came out, and I couldn't leave the hall to go get it. I'll never forget the look on Karen's face when I knocked on the door and told her that getting the residents fed shouldn't count as petty mess, so I needed her to go get the trays. Luckily, Karen was staying late, and this didn't last longer than this one day. The residents kept complaining, and finally, Miss Red, our nosiest resident who crashed the mandatory meeting, lead a lot of the complaining residents to Karen's office. One of those residents was Miss Carr. She yelled at Karen so loud because she couldn't get her ice that people started peeking around the corner to see what was going on. Karen tried her hardest to defuse the situation and explain to Miss VIP why the rule was in place. Miss Carr was having none of it. Karen didn't know that Miss Carr used to be a nurse, and that's why the director of the facility made her a VIP. After her tongue lashing, Karen came up to me, seething with anger. Through her gritted teeth, she said, You can leave the hall as long as it is it pertains to patient care. 
She slammed her office door so hard that I something inside of it fell. I heard her say, crap, on the other side of the door after the crash. <laughs> Karen didn't last much longer after this because the facility had a lot of demanding residents and an even more demanding director. I don't know what was happening on the administration side, but I hear horror stories all the times about it. The next one is an entitled people story. So last year, I ended a toxic friendship with a girl who I'd known for over 20 years. We had our ups and downs, but she started emotionally blackmailing me to divorce my husband. In addition to that, she was dating a guy who was in a band with a man who literally tried to kill my dog and threatened me. I couldn't be friends with her anymore for these and other reasons like tearing me down, insulting my intelligence, and constantly trying to manipulate me into agreeing with everything she did and said. I was a weak little pushover, and I recognize that and do not deny it. I was scared to end the friendship because in the past she had brutally slandered me and hurt relationships in my life. But finally I just did it and calmly ended the friendship. She promised me she wouldn't try to hurt me, but within days she sent a deeply inappropriate email to my place of work, vehemently telling me what a terrible, disgusting person I was and threatening me. I immediately blocked her on everything to protect myself, but it wasn't enough. Within months I was hearing about her slander and lies, and it was beyond disturbing. She lied so much I can't even understand how she sleeps at night. She even claimed it was her who ended the friendship, which is like those petty people who get dumped and then try to tell everyone they dumped the person. I didn't respond in any way. I have a mortgage, good job, and lots of responsibility with a farm to manage. I wrongly assumed she would stop and get tired of slandering me, but she didn't. She still is doing it. I've lost two significant friendships because of this slandering, and while I understand that those friends weren't healthy for me considering they ghosted me because of slander, it still hurt. Then I got a cruel message after getting major surgery from a shared friend, literally shredding me apart. This was from a person I had welcomed into my home earlier that year, and gone out of my way to host kindly and generously. But I didn't respond to that either. I simply deleted it and moved on. But this girl won't stop. I just want her to forget about me, but she won't. Her hatred is unreal. The lies have distorted me into this absolute monster when I'm not. I'm autistic, and an addict in recovery and survived severe childhood sexual abuse. I am slow to anger and allow people to trample me. My family was part of a cult, and despite all of this, I've done whatever I can to be a kind and gentle person, but my patience with this is gone. I want to sue her for slander and defamation, but I just can't gather the courage to do it. I regret the friendship so much. She used and abused me, and when I didn't obey her demands for my private life, she threw a massive tantrum and won't stop trying to hurt me. She claims I almost destroyed her life, which is actually comical considering I simply ended a toxic friendship and never contacted her again. I didn't email her work. I didn't slander her to anyone. I didn't talk about her to our mutual friends. I acted like a 34-year-old adult woman. I don't even know why I'm writing this besides to warn people. If you know in your gut someone is bad news, walk away. Do it before I did because you may end up in a similar nightmare. I just want to live and she won't leave me be. It's obsessive and creepy at best and illegal slander at its worst. The next one is an entitled parent story. Some context here, I was in the army for five years and was near a IEDD when it exploded and have some scars on my arms and legs. Cast, me, my wife, Karen's husband, Karen, and her kid. This took place two years ago and we had a semi-big 4th of July party. It was hot out and I was had shorts and a tank top on. Some scars were visible, but most were fixed with surgery. The main one was on my arm and running from my shoulder to my elbow. A kid asked me why I had it, and I just said I got hurt. He just walked away to his mom and dad. I was standing at the grill like any dad at a party, and Karen stormed over and just started yelling that what I told her son traumatized him. I was confused for a minute before she pointed at my arm. Apparently I was an awful person for doing this. The yelling attracted my wife and Karen's husband. The husband was mad at me because I made his wife angry and what not. My wife tried to calm them down with me to no use. Karen yelled that I need to leave my own party because I was big and scary to the kids and she thought that I was threatening to her. I apologized for looking scary, but I also explained that I will not leave my own party, but her family is free to leave. We ended up just asking them to leave after a loud argument. The worst part is that I burned the burgers. Thank you for watching. I would really appreciate it if you could like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow.